What will you do to unlock innovation? In today's fast-paced world, innovation might not be enough. Tomorrow's pioneers of change will need to be agile, able to adapt, and committed like never before. Your host, Santa Vending, invites you to listen in and join business leaders from around the world as they share their visions for success in our future business challenges. Welcome to Mind Innovation. I'm your host, Senna Vending. I'm always excited to learn. And in today's podcast, we'll talk about agility, how to move from doing agile to being agile. I want to welcome Ricardo Librato. He's also the founder of the Agile Club. Uh, he helps companies achieve successful transformation by adopting the most valuable strategies in implementing Agile and DevOps. So welcome, Ricardo. I'm so glad, finally, because we've been scheduling this for some time to have you as a guest. Uh, we know each other through Clubhouse, and we met through the club that you actually founded. And uh, you helped me on the way to, to be on Clubhouse, so thank you so much. But, but welcome. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Good. Um, so Agile is about respect, collaboration, improvement, learning, cycles, ownership, delivering value, and also the ability to change. So, so let's jump right into it. What, what's the difference between doing Agile and, and being Agile? Yeah. Uh, there is a, a model that is much used in Agile, which is called the Shuhari model, which is uh, you, you start by just doing some stuff and then uh, you start start by changing uh, what you're doing and then finally you can master and I'm totally against that model uh, because people think that teaching agile is like teaching uh, teaching a martial art and it's not teaching agile is about teaching this mindset that we are always uh, questioning what we are doing we are always finding better ways of doing things and that we are always focused on the outcome and uh, in the industry, there are a lot of people that are trying to bring frameworks. They are trying to say, you have to do Scrum, you have to do that. Nothing like that. If you look at Agile, it's all about plan, do, check, act. It's all about being able to think about what you want to do, work on it as a team, reflect on what you did, have psychological safety to bring out the best in everyone that is in your team, the, all the opinions matter, and then do something, learn from it, and then get a bit better at it. It's about the power of compound interest. You don't, you don't restructure everything. Every time you do something, you say, hey, if we did that a little bit better, it's going to get even better. And then if you get 1% better every week, have you ever calculated how much better you get by the end of the year? Yeah, and it's quite a few times. 1.01 1 .01 raised to the 53. Yeah. So being agile is about having this mindset that you and the team are continuously trying to improve and that you and your team have a relentless focus on your customers. And there is no practice that can give you that, only the mindset. So being agile is about having these two core values of agile there and doing agile is about just we do stand-ups in the morning we do we do planning on mondays all those things are valuable but what yeah. is really valuable is the mindset okay so to that you you just mentioned the teams right so how do you how do you get a, a team to be a high performing team do you have meetings how many meetings or not meetings do you need is it is it the dynamic of the team that works together or how do how do you transform a whole team yeah you can look at what the military does the military is the best factory of high performing teams do you know what they do they put a bunch of people through obstacles that they can only overcome as a team and when this bunch of people overcome those obstacles together they become a team so my trick uh, the way i usually ramp up teams is i run very quick iterations I run five sprints in one week and I give them some really hard stuff to do. When they overcome this stuff together and they reflect on it, mm -hmm. they become a lot better as a team. That doesn't mean that they are a perfect team by the end of week one, but they just went through five cycles of iteration of becoming a great team. You don't make a team by doing easy stuff. You make a team by overcoming hard stuff together. Might be a bit of a radical approach, but that's how. No, I no, no. You you find your friends as well, right? And you also find the strength, yeah. 
um, of, of your team members or, or who to brainstorm with or how to problem solving. Um, so no, that, that's a really good, um, that's a good example of it. Yeah, and uh, very important is that once you have a team, you have to have the team select who joins the team next. If you start just adding members to a team without them, every time that you change the composition of a team, you go again through this whole process. But if you allow the team to be part of the selection of which new members join that team, that period is much shorter. That's another quick hint. So, so is there first um, you form a team, then you keep yeah, it. Keep it. <laughs> um, so with all your experience, do you have a, a magic number of saying it, it's to get started before you then grow the team? Uh, is there is there a magic number where you're saying this is best if you're doing all these sprint that you're doing in the first week? Oh, magic number is quite easy because the, this is mathematics. Uh, a team there is a number of channels of communication inside the team, which is n multiplied by n minus one. And the, from all the studies that I've seen, between five and nine people is the number of people that you can make into a high performance team. Kind of seven is the magic number, but it's better to have a team with nine people that can do that can cover the whole range of activities that the team needs to do than to have a team with five people that are not able to do anything because they have external dependencies. So you have to balance these two things. But I, I've never seen high performing teams that have more than eight or, or eight or nine people. I've, de I've, I've seen very interesting teams with around 20 people yeah. that uh, break themselves up into smaller squads when they have to face a challenge. So that's another pattern I've observed that is not very common in Agile, but I've seen teams of 20 to 25 people at most that every sprint, they look at the work that they have to do and then they break themselves up into smaller teams and go face those challenges and then come back. But that's a lot harder to ramp up than a, than a five to seven person teams. And that's actually more of a team of teams that you, that you create there. I have okay. a fantastic example that I coach every week that is a team like that, but that's a really rare case. The yeah. usual case, five to nine people. Okay. So that actually takes me in because I was going to ask you about if you could scale Agile. Um, I don't know if you want to say scale in, in team members or if you can scale it in the whole transformation into an organization. So how, what's, what's the best practice you have seen here? Scaling Agile is incredibly easy, but first you need to have some Agile to scale. Yeah, <laughs> that's the first big mistake that people make yeah. because scaling, scaling means multiplying like, right? Yeah. So if you're multiplying, you need to start with a number bigger than zero. So first get some agility. Then once you have agility, you can start to multiply it. The way that you scale agile is with lean. So if you look at it, you have a team, they are part and they are agile. They are part of a bigger process. Then you start to look at the whole process and see, do we have some more teams that are part of this process? Could we optimize this process using lean by adding more teams? And then you start that team as the seed until you have a whole value stream that is agile. Once you have one value stream that is agile, then you can start looking for other value streams. I'm saying it's easy. Conceptually, it's really yeah, hard. Yeah, it's do. always really Most hard. companies fail at it. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, have you gone in and, and actually easy. fixed teams like this? That where they, yeah, where they fail? I have, I'm a coach for teams of teams and I tend to be called in when teams of teams are not working. And then, I, look, you have a team of teams. It's kind of a system of systems because you have to think of the team and all the systems that that team touches. So I actually use Lean to scale Agile. So I look at Agile as we have a big complex system. What do you do in Lean with it? First, you visualize everything that is happening. Then you start to find what are the biggest impediments that you have. And then you run one or two experiments at a time to keep on moving in the direction of that system working better.
Yeah. So you don't yeah. fix a system that is not agile. Every system has a level of agility. It can be very low or it can be very high. Then you have to have something that you are trying to strive for. Maybe you are striving for optimizing lead times. Maybe you are striving from, for going to market. It's very important to have a goal so that you can explain to everyone in one sentence why they are there. Then you say, okay, that is the goal that we have. This is where we are. What is the biggest obstacle that we have to get there? And then you fight that obstacle and you fight it in very short cycles. You measure the heck out of it and you go into a continuous improvement cycle. That's how that's how you fix how you, a non-agile system into an agile system. Yeah. So so that's also how you will measure it, right? If you're saying you're setting these goals and, and you're saying you just start measuring um, yeah. the heck out of you it. Start, <laughs> you, you measure two things. Yeah. We talk a, a little bit about lean, right? Yeah. So what is the fundamental thing to measure lean systems or lean processes is the cumulative flow diagram. The, right so you try to find some metrics that are predictive about the process and normally the cfd is the best tool that you have for that that's internal measurement you don't set targets on that you use that to observe the system and to see how the system is behaving and what is the impact of the interventions that you are doing you never set a target on a cfd we want a cycle time like this no you use the cfd to see how the interventions you are doing are impacting the system. But the targets that you set are on the outcome of that system. So if a team, if what you have is a quality problem, mm -hmm. you set the target on escape defects, for example, and you start measuring those. How many things that you are building have defects that escape into production? And then you can work back from those defects and try to see, can I find some predictive metrics for this? Can I find some leading metrics? Because if your outcomes are only coming every six months, you're going to improve very slowly. Yeah. So one of the tricks is if you have something that only happens every six months, then find something that happens every month or something that happens every week or something that happens every day to improve. But it's always try to improve the outcome of the system, measure the outcome, find predictive metrics then to get to that outcome, and use the CFD to see what is the impact that you are doing on the system. The CFD, the control chart, uh, traditional things. Treat the teams as a system, observe the system, monitor, improve the behavior, the outcome. Okay, so to, to get to all this and, and have a team, and again, back to the high-performing team and the whole adaptability, what, what's the, how do you, how do you transform the organization? And, and people are all different. We're all different. Some people will say, yes, I'm on it, right? We're running in this direction. We'll do it. We'll be, you know, all these new things. We'll, we'll do it. We'll love it. Um, but you will also have um, team members in the organizations that is not happy about change. Um, I've been in different organizations. You have the whole, every flavor of everybody. Um, so I'm sure you've seen the same flavors um, of everyone. So what's, what's, your, what's your advice or your best practice to, to win everybody to go in the same direction? First of all is to have something that everyone is striving for. And that's the role of the leadership to really set a compelling outcome. And uh, especially the more mature that we are, the more those outcomes cannot just be improve the bottom line of the company. Look at companies, more modern companies today, like Patagonia or Apple. They really strive for improving the world. They have objectives around their stakeholders. So you need to find, as leaders, something that you are trying to achieve that you can make everyone want to do. And that is the awareness stage. They need to make people aware of that. Then we need to work with people on what's in it for me. The aspiration stage, making sure that people aspire towards that goal. And not everyone will, will aspire initially, but you need to have at least 30% of the people that are aspiring to that goal so that you have enough mass. Because you always have a number of people that will never care because they are laggards by nature. 
and you have a few people that are enthusiastic and you have a lot of people in the middle that just follow what looks like it's succeeding. So it's all about creating these early ambassadors that you cannot be the one running naked alone and saying, let's dance. <laughs> you have to get more people to dance with you. <laughs> so it all starts with the leadership. It starts with compelling outcomes and starts with getting these early ambassadors that will dare then drag everyone behind you. The other trick I do is to always make sure that we have some kind of success after three weeks and some kind of success after three months that will help to build momentum. So although you're tr you try to do something that was hard, yeah, but that by working the new way becomes a bit easier, or at least you are able to overcome it, you celebrate it together. And then, you know, success breeds success and you start to have this uh, snowball growing. Uh, this snowball effect. Um, but I'm not a very traditional coach. Most, most coaches don't work like this. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you're successful. What about, um, yeah. So what, what about failure? Because you need to have trust in the team as well. And if you, even though you're saying you want to have a success after three weeks and after three months, um, you also need to, to trust each other and, and raise your hand and saying, hey, this is not working. We need to rethink it or we need to look at the problem in a different angle. Mm -hmm. To, to get there. Um, and it's not easy for everyone in an organization to raise their hand and saying, I don't know what I'm doing, or maybe they have questions, but they are afraid of asking questions. So how do you go in and then create, I don't know if you want to call it a safety net or just to give this, this trust, because that is so important. You have, this is one of the toughest transformations and depends on the original culture of the company. There is not one single way of getting there some there are many different techniques that you can try the mo the technique everyone proposes to you is that the leader steps up and admits a previous failure that he had yeah <laughs> that helps yeah. that doesn't build a culture but it is a start yeah but you basically need to get at all levels that people realize that we are trying to do complex stuff to try complex stuff, we are not exactly going to fail. We are going to try a lot of things that don't work. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. I don't know if you remember that Thomas Edison quote that he said, I didn't have 10,000 failures. I found 10,000 things that don't work. Yeah. And that's it. That is what failure is. That is a natural outcome of our process. I work with an organization that uh, they're in Sweden near you or between mm -hmm. you and me, um, <laughs> that had a very fearless culture, but at the same time, they were, they were not very good at failure, at embracing failure. And once we realized that we were failing, but you're not learning from the failures, we started to set tar targets of failure. So we set a target that 60% of the initiatives that we were starting had to fail. Otherwise, that meant that we are not starting hard enough things. That was easy to sell to leadership. They were, they were able to understand. If you're only trying things that succeed, you're not going to innovate. No. You have to try things that fail. And then the other metric that you set is how fast you fail. You want to fail a lot and you want to fail as fast as you can. I know people who are listening to this are saying it didn't really tell me anything, but it's a really hard area. But yeah. see where you are and try to find how you can make the company embrace failure. Because it's not failure, it's trying things that don't work. Yeah, and, yeah, and it gives you the learning. Complex the... environment. Yeah. 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 No, I agree. Okay, I'll stop calling it failures. <laughs> from from today. No, but it's okay to call them failures. <laughs> but I but I really like to call them things that didn't quite work. <laughs> yeah. That we had to try. We found out we found out that trying to sell these to our customers doesn't work. Great. Let's try to sell them something else. That didn't work. Oh, here is one thing that increased our revenue by twenty percent. Great. If we didn't try the other two, we wouldn't have found this one. Yeah. That's the kind of spirit you want. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's a journey on the way, right? Yeah. It's a learning journey. What, isn't that what you're trying to create learning organizations? It, yeah. You don't learn by being always right. Otherwise you didn't need to learn in the first place. No, and nobody's perfect, right? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> no, 
Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you are, no. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, um, okay, what about, so you started the, the Agile Club, right? So I want to talk about um, agility community. So why is it important to, to have a community? Um, and there's, I've seen a lot of them popping up. Maybe, maybe it's because I'm just aware of them now more. That could be one thing. Mm -hmm. um, but, but how do you, why did you start it? And, and it's growing really, really fast. Yeah, I think we reached 3,000 members today. So we can celebrate Congratulations. that. Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But think about if you don't have community. Think of the opposite. And I've been in that place. You are working in an organization and the only people that you speak with are the other people in that organization. You start to have a bit of group think. You don't see anything new. You only learn from a very small group of people. That's what happens when you don't have community. Mm -hmm. When you have community, you are exposed to all levels of agility. I learn every day that I open a room in Clubhouse and sometimes from people that wrote books and sometimes from a guy that is trying to come into Agile. And it's this diversity in learning in the community that I love. So it's getting out of the group think that typically happens in agile management offices in companies yeah because you have it's everyone in the same agile culture in the same thought bubble so for coaches especially and scrum masters it's really important to be exposed to things that are happening outside their organization by being part of the community is how you're going to be able to see what is great and what really sucks and if you learn to recognize what is great and what is really what really sucks, is not that the job of the coach to be able to articulate, to, to show to people what is great and then help them come up with solutions to get there. Mm -hmm. You need to be able to see it. And if you just say, stay inside the same bubble, you don't. That's why I love community. Yeah, I, I like it because it's, sometimes you sit there and, and it's, it's great to see you're not alone with your problem. Every, somebody else is facing maybe similar or all the same problem. Um, and I also like it when to look into different industries. So it's, yeah. it's always great to see how somebody else solved a problem because you can mimic some of the solutions sometimes and saying, oh, let me try that angle when I go back into the office and see if, if that works. Um, and then it, maybe it'll just be a learning. But <laughs> I remember we had clubhouse rooms where there were people talking about agility in architects in Iran that's so far field from us, yeah. they have an agile framework for architecture in Iran. And I was like, that's fantastic. Let me learn more about this. I would never have been exposed to it without, yeah. without the community. No. So it, that, was, that was my next question here, because I wanted to ask, you know, what, what, what have you learned now by being the founder of this club? Um, so, mm -hmm. so that's one example. Do you have another example of, of something you wouldn't have been exposed to? Oh, so many. Um, I learned a lot about autism, for example. Yeah. There are a few members of the community that were teaching us uh, how to handle autism in agile teams because there is a, a strong correlation between members of, of uh, technical teams and people with autism. So I learned a lot about that and I had never even thought about it. Yeah. I learned about the heart framework from Ian Banner. I still remember that. So it was a, a way of uh, opening up uh, with your team and starting to really get to the, the personal well-being, which is fundamental for, uh, for being able to become a team. There are many, I think, especially on what we usually call the soft aspects of Agile, I learned a lot from the community because I tend to work more on the hard parts because I tend to be working with groups of 40 or 50 teams. Yeah. Uh, so I, st I, I sometimes can start becoming a bit disconnected from the reality of a team. And in the Agile Club, there are so many people that come that have just one team. And then uh, I have to think a bit and say, I never thought about that. That's really cool. And that helps me in the work with the, with the big teams because you don't want to be up in that pedestal as leader of an Agile transformation without understanding to what, what's happening to people on the ground. So it yeah. really opened my mind for that. That's awesome. I want to join some of these groups again. Um, yeah. yeah. Me so too. I'm so busy lately. <laughs> yeah. We have no time. One room per week or two at most. 
Um, so creativity, right? Um, I see it's, it's the fuel, fuel for innovation. So question here is, are, are you born with it or can you be taught it? I think born in creativity and then the school system beats it out of them. And some people get less, a, let, a, a bit less beaten out of the creative path. And those are the ones that we call creatives. And some other, the education system managed to kick the whole creativity out of them. And then you have to give them back. So the cure is simple. Stop having uh, an education system that is just teaching people to solve complicated things and to repeat and solve things that were solved before and have an education system that is a lot, a lot more about solving complex things because that's the domain we are in. We have an education system that was designed to train people to work in factories. That's where the education system was created in the 1800s and it hasn't changed that much. There are a lot of good experiments going on that I read occasionally about of having something a lot more goal oriented and a lot more in the complex quadrant. I always talk about the complex and the complicated quadrant from the Kinevin model. And that's the shift that we are doing. Yeah. We have been in the sixties, we were in the complicated quadrant doing the same thing one million times more efficiently. And now we are on the complex quadrant, which is doing one million times a different thing. And the school system hasn't caught up. So my opinion, everyone is born creative. Some, some maybe are born a bit less creative than others. Like some are taller and some are shorter, but yeah. just look at the child, the questions yeah. they ask, the curiosity they have. If we can keep that until adulthood, we'll all be creative. Keep asking questions. So what's the, what's the most important thing you can do in, in your space when in the term of learning or being creative? Good question. Joining things like the Agile Club is yeah. very important to learn. And especially if you listen to something and then you get curious and say, I'm going to research more about this. I, the way that I personally learn is by trying to teach something. If I want to teach something, I need to learn it. Yeah. But um, for me, though, those would be the two hints that I would that I would come come in with. So join communities that will challenge you and show you new stuff, but then dive deeply into the things because in a one hour conversation, you only will learn a bit shallowly about it. But the internet is so big. Go on Google, find a good book about it, listen to the book, listen to podcasts like yours. And that's how you learn yeah. creativity. Just go wild and try new things every week. Yeah. And don't be afraid of it. Right? Jump in and, yeah. and, and ask. I think with the uh, with Clubhouse as well, it opens up that yeah. you can you can explore and listen right there and then in so many directions and so many topics. Um and you will meet people that you will never, I would never have met them. Um, yeah. and, and it's just inspiring. And you can, then you can decide if you want to follow them or not follow them. Or, there's so many options, of course, but, but it opens up um, a key, like a continuous learning journey. Um, yeah. So, so I'm, I'm a big fan of, of, of Clubhouse. Um, so what, what will you, oh, yeah? If you think of, you know, the liberating structures, right? No. Or if you don't, that is something for you to learn. Google okay. liberating structures. It's a website that has a lot of different ways of running a meeting uh, to have the audience learn. It's a fantastic website and book and everything. And one of the liberating structures is called an open space. And Clubhouse is an audio open space the size of the world. So now I gave you something to learn and we can talk yeah. about that in the next yeah. podcast. <laughs> I'll, I'll follow up on that one. Um, yeah. Okay. So what, what will you tell Ricardo like 10 years ago? I would tell him to focus a lot more on outcomes and a lot less on processes. The Ricardo of 10 years ago uh, still believed that he could fix things with processes and he was really good at it. Yeah. And uh, he fixed a lot of stuff with it. But I think once I realized the power of outcomes, the power of motivating people around outcomes, uh, my work became 10x. And I, I wish I had done that 10 years ago, not five. So definitely outcomes. 
the outcomes. What, what about being um, like a mentor or a coach? Did you have one over the last, uh, not the last minute, but you know, when, when you started in working, did you have a, did you have a coach? I started in Agile very early. Yeah. I only found I was working Agile for 10 years be before I learned the word Agile itself. Because I, I, I was doing rapid application development and I was doing a lot of other stuff. As a coach, there was a very influential Swedish guy. Uh, he was actually working for me because I was a transformation lead, but he became my mentor because that guy was brilliant. Uh, Johan Dahlbeck. He passed away last year, but amazing, amazing person. And uh, he was my mentor and now I'm looking for a new one. So, so what will your advice be? Because I, I think it's great to have a mentor. Um, but, but how do you, if you just started right out of college or in your mid career, how do you, how do you get started? Do you, do you find your community? Do you read the books and how do you, how do you contact a person or, or get that dialogue started? If you have a job, some companies have mentorship programs, so that would be the easiest way. If you don't have a job yet, uh, join a community and, uh, always think when I think about community, I always think about what are you giving to the community so that you can then get something back. And most mentors will be attracted by seeing people that even though they are in the beginning of their career, they are already trying to give you, if you just, it's really hard to get a mentor by just walking up to someone yeah. and saying, okay. can you be my mentor? Do you have yeah. two, three hours every week to be my mentor? Yeah. So don't ask what the mentor can do for you. Ask what can you do for the mentor? or for the community where the mentor is, and then the mentor will take you on. That would be my best advice. If you have a company, a lot easier. Find their mentorship program. Sometimes it's called talent. Sometimes it's called career success program. And then you might be able to get assigned one. And it's better to have the first mentor than none at all, right? Yeah, yeah. No, that's a, that's a really good advice. So thank you so much for, for being on my podcast today. Um, it opened up. I, I need to research something now, but um, I'm, I'm, yes. I learned a lot today. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. I also learned a lot today and uh, looking forward to listening to your podcast again. <laughs> thank thank you. you. Have a great day. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Bye -bye. If you enjoyed this podcast, maybe you'd like to hear more. Please subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. Be sure also to check out our website, mindtheinnovation.com. And otherwise, stay curious and keep learning.